What's up, YouTube? Two new episodes of Jesse Ventura's Conspiracy Theory to cover since my last response video. Last week's episode on time travel and the one that aired Monday night on Steve Huff's mansion fortress and the underground bases in the Ozark Mountains. I'll begin with the time travel conspiracy and, of course, start my discussion around the physics of time travel and the technical difficulties of actually building a time machine. I'll then cover some of the paradoxes associated with time travel and the reason why many physicists reject the matter altogether. In order to build a working time machine, you would need to accelerate your body or a vessel containing your body to superluminal velocities. That is, you would need to break the speed of light. However, due to Lorentz transformations, as you begin to approach the speed of light, your mass actually increases and it becomes harder and harder for you to accelerate any faster. I would compare it with trying to reach the temperature of absolute zero. All the laws of physics begin to break down and work against you, making it exponentially harder and harder the closer you get, preventing you from ever achieving your goal. So a spaceship or hypertrain doesn't quite look like it's going to cut it. The only thing physicists know of in the universe that's actually capable of breaking the light barrier is a black hole, and the only foreseeable way I can think of actually achieving time travel would be to penetrate and come back from the event horizon of a black hole. Of course, it's very tricky to escape from a black hole once you've penetrated the event horizon, but I have an idea of how you might be able to do it. Theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson came up with the idea for a cosmic superstructure called a Dyson Sphere, basically a gigantic shell constructed around an entire star like our Sun, perhaps built by some super advanced alien race. Now, if you were to build one of these Dyson spheres around a black hole, it might be possible to create a time machine in this way, by creating the means to suspend a time capsule or some sort of structure into the black hole and pull it back out again. Of course, this idea itself is wrought with all sorts of technical problems itself, such as the forces and velocities involved, but I can't come up with any other technically reasonable method for breaking the light barrier than this. Black holes are the only thing in the cosmos that we know of that can accelerate massive objects to beyond the speed of light, which is what you'd need to do in order to create a time machine. Another interesting idea I had uses Hal Putoff's polarizable vacuum approach to general relativity, whereby if you alter the permeability and permittivity of free space to where the speed of light changes, you can go superluminal, at least relativistically, since you've changed the speed of light locally. One idea I had for achieving this was through the use of a spaceship covered externally with metamaterials, whereby the speed of light around the ship for passengers inside would be altered, possibly allowing the craft to slipstream. Of course, this is all just theoretical, and there are many other things to account for with the big picture of time travel and its implications on reality. The two main arguments against time travel are, number one, if time travel is possible, then why haven't time travelers from the future come back in time yet? Of course, there are some who will argue that no one can prove they haven't, and others who will argue that they have, and events like Roswell and UFO sightings are actually time travelers from the future. Um, number two is the grandfather paradox. If you could travel back in time and kill one of your ancestors, like your grandfather, for example, then your parents would never have been born, and your very existence would become a paradox, since how would you have ever been born without parents? Of course, theoretical physics, as always, has come up with resolutions for these paradoxes alternate timelines, multiple dimensions, and parallel universes. I will attempt to break these concepts down for you as best as I can. At every point in time and space, we have possibilities and probabilities. We also have free will to act on our own and affect the outcomes of any given situation in our life. Now, if you were to go back and change one of those choices, say undo a mistake you made in your past, you would alter the entire chain of events which followed the original action. But at the point of action itself, there exists a variety of possible outcomes, each of which branches out into an alternate reality or parallel universe. So just before that moment of action, all the different possible outcomes or realities exist all at once, but as soon as that action takes place, there is a collapse of the wave function, and all the other possibilities are destroyed so that only one reality remains. But are those alternate timelines actually destroyed, or do they branch off simultaneously into multiverses or parallel realities? It's an interesting theoretical question, but I wonder if it has any actual bearing on our reality. Sure, in a parallel universe, Romney might have won the election, for example, or you may have married your high school sweetheart. But does that have any actual meaning or bearing on the actuality in which we exist? Clearly, in this reality, Obama won the election and Romney didn't. Well, Goldman Sachs actually won, but we won't go there. Let's suppose for a moment that time travel is possible, and we can revisit these events or pivotal moments in our history and go back and change things, so that one of these alternate timelines becomes the new reality. What then would happen to the alternate reality that we originally came from? 
Sure, it's an interesting thought experiment to consider that all these realities or parallel universes can exist simultaneously, but does that have any actual bearing or physical meaning in reality itself? Since at any one time we can only exist inside of one actuality, it's not realistic to consider that we exist in several alternate realities at once, unless, of course, you're Schrodinger's a cat, and certainly quantum mechanics appears to function in this way before the box is open and the wave function collapses. But once you do open that box, you can't just close it again and expect everything to return back to the original state of ambiguity that existed before. Sure, you can assume that both realities have branched off into different dimensions which exist simultaneously, but do these alternate realities or non-realities actually mean anything anymore in this actual physical actuality in which we exist? Think about it. If you travel back in time and change any one little thing in the past, you will completely destroy the reality from which you came. You would branch off then into an alternate reality. Therefore, any action taken by a time traveler has absolutely no physical influence or bearing over the reality from which they came. So this theoretical resolution to the time travel paradox actually serves to disprove the entire notion of time travel. Since time travel can have no effect on the original reality from which the time traveler came, it simply branches off into a different reality, which doesn't really mean anything in actuality. The only foreseeable way that time travel could exist and get around all the paradoxes is for you to travel to a parallel universe or alternate timeline, which of course has no bearing or meaning in the original universe from which you came. So in reality, time travel cannot and will not ever become an actuality, because anyone who travels back in time will be transported to a parallel universe which has no bearing or physical meaning on this one. If you were to actually create a time machine, it would transport you to a parallel universe which has no meaning or actuality in this universe, since you could never ever get back to this timeline. Therefore, time travel cannot possibly exist inside this universe or actuality, since the very act of time travel would transport you to a parallel universe which has no meaning or effect on the one in which we all live. The time travelers would exist in a newly created alternate reality and could never come back to this one, meaning that this reality, the reality in which we all live and in which you're watching this video right now, time travel is and always will be totally meaningless, even if it were possible. Paradox solved, time travel debunked. All in all, time travel is the perfect disinformation tool, since it removes all contextual reality and certainty of historical context by the notion that this reality could be altered by changing events in the past. This removes all certainties about reality itself, thereby allowing any disinformation agent to use the notion of time travel to alter the perception or contextual meaning of any historical event. And disinfo agents are all about removing certainty and context with regards to historical events. Okay, so now for the Illuminati Endgame Conspiracy episode. I was happy to see Mark Dice on the show. I always enjoy Mark's videos and his sense of humor and approach to various conspiracy topics and parodies of others in the truth movement. He did a really nice job dumbing down his descriptions of the Illuminati for the mindless television audience. Although apart from the show, I think that he makes a huge mistake when he assumes that his online audience is equally as ignorant. I admire Mark Dice's confidence, but not his arrogance, especially when he assumes that he knows more than everyone else or has read more books or seen more documentaries than everyone else out there. Heidegger would have a field day with this one. I read a ton of books too, Mark. Probably a lot of different stuff than you would read. Also, both you and I come from very different academic and intellectual backgrounds. So even if we both read the same books and watched all the same documentaries, we would undoubtedly come away with different interpretations and conclusions. All I'm saying is try avoid claiming that you have a corner on the truth market. We all have different pieces of the puzzle, and we are all searching for the same thing. Hopefully, the truth. We'd love to talk one-on-one -on -one with you sometime, Mark, maybe even do some video collaborations or record a Skype interview. I even sent you an email, but being an internet celebrity myself, I understand why we don't always get back to everyone who contacts us, especially from a guy who calls himself alien scientist, so I understand. Aside from that, though, I thought that this week's episode was a hell of a lot better than the last three on reptilians, Tesla's death ray, and time travel. What I didn't understand, though, is how they got the aerial footage of Stephen Huff walking around the compound with those blueprints in his hand when in the show they claimed that he was avoiding them. Was that footage shot by someone else, or was that guy just a contractor? I, d I didn't get that. 
I also wanted to comment on the Ozark Ozark symbolism. L. Frank Baum's original story, The Wizard of Oz, was pretty much all symbolism for the creation of the Federal Reserve. The yellow brick road represents the gold standard, Dorothy's slippers were silver, not ruby in the original story, and the Emerald City represents Washington, or the city where green money is made and surrounded by a field of drug-producing opium poppies. And of course, the ominous man behind the curtain. There are many papers and documentaries on this. I suggest my audience look up and watch those. I was really disappointed that they didn't make that reference in the show. As for the Illuminati, I've never really given my breakdown of this before, so here it goes. First off, I hate the word Illuminati. I think that this is a dumbed-down way to explain what essentially amounts to a pyramid scheme of massive global control. I seriously doubt any of the people at the top of the power structure actually refer to themselves as the Illuminati or that they all conspire and collaborate with one another all the time. I instead prefer the analogy of a group of gangsters at a card table, all fighting over a piece of the pot. Different players constantly rotate in and out of the game, and sure, they will shoot each other from time to time, but if anyone tries to come in and interrupt their card game, they'll all get up and shoot that person. Of course, analogies only go so far, but my point is that these elites are not nearly as well organized as they might have you believe. If they were, then we'd already have a new world order and a one world government. The pyramid is symbolic of the structure of leadership and command. If you want to find out who is at the top of the pyramid, simply find out who people take their orders from and trace it all the way back to the top. If you look at the structure of any corporation, which is basically what our government has become, a giant mega conglomerate, you will see the management is compartmented into various divisions with individual bosses managing other managers and bosses operating below those managers in each division. It would be impossible for one person to manage all the underlings of the company themselves, so they have a pyramid-like structure of control that is set up in order for the company to operate efficiently and effectively. Now on top of that, you have the secret societies which operate inside every one of the top colleges and universities in the country. They want to ensure that the best and brightest minds in the country get tapped into their organizations. As the older gangsters in the card table die off, they need to be replaced by young, fresh recruits. This is more or less the Illuminati training ground, if you want to call it that. These college recruits get tapped into positions of political, business, economic, intelligence, military, and government power structures. So that's my breakdown of what the Illuminati is and how it relates to these secret societies. Follow the money, follow the power structure, up the chain of command if you want to know who's running the show. Forces move objects, pressures move fluids, and money moves people. If you want to figure out who's pulling the strings, follow the money. That's how the strings get pulled. The board of directors for a company is only going to hire the CEO that maximizes profits. That doesn't mean that they are part of the Illuminati. A lot of the current power structure are people like you and me that aren't doing this because they're evil or are part of some elite conspiracy. They're simply looking out for their own best interests. They want to keep their job and they want to keep making money. People want to point their fingers at the elites when they should be pointing them at the system itself. This entire corrupt system is the problem. We need to take out the entire card game and not just the gangsters sitting at the table. I look forward to your comments and suggestions for further research and information and anything you have to say about, you know, my coverage of these two past episodes. Thanks for watching. Keep up the good fight.